It is my great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, who is an outstanding leader and an outstanding entrepreneur. Mr. Randall Kirk was named chairman of Intrexon. And I'll tell you a little bit more, a little later, what Intrexon is, in case you don't know. He was named chairman of Intrexon in February 2008 and was appointed chief executive officer in April 2009. Mr. Kirk serves on the board of directors of several important corporations, foundations, and academic institutions. In fact, too many for me to have time to list them right here. Mr. Kirk began his professional career in a private law practice. He received his bachelor's uh, his BA in business from Radford University and a JD from the University of Virginia. Let me now say just a few words about Intrexon for those of you who are not familiar with this outstanding corporation. Intrexon addresses some of the world's biggest problems through the application of biology. One area that has received enormous attention recently is the work to stop the mosquito that transmits the Zika virus. Intraxon subsidiary, Oxitex, produces genetically engineered mosquitoes that are currently being deployed in Brazil and the Cayman Islands and hopefully soon in the United States as well. Most of us, I believe, have heard about this initiative without necessarily having the details. There are many other exciting products from Intraxon, but I'll leave those to Mr. Kirk to tell you about or to tell us about. So, Mr. Kirk, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Kinstrup uh, Anderson. My thanks to Ambassador Quinn and the conference organizers. Um, it's a true honor to be here with so many laureates who've contributed so much to society, uh, not only this year's winners, but um, past year's winners. I'm happy to say I know a couple of them. And uh, um, they are, I'm not, a, I'm not a very religious person, but let me just say, I, I think this, is, this community is doing God's work. It's a, it's a phrase we hillbillies use <laughs> to mean they're, they're, they're contributing significantly to mankind. And, uh, my, uh, my heart goes out to them in, in, in gratitude. So during this conference, I've had a number of interesting meetings already, some with government officials and some with representatives of private industry, academics. And in every conversation so far, there seems to be what, uh, to use a trite phrase, an 800 pound gorilla in the room. So someone will ask, well, how are things going on the regulatory front? You know, some of them know that the FDA studied our salmon for 12 years before rendering its decision that, of course, it's fine. <laughs> you know, it's environmentally safe. It's basically a salmon. But so they ask about this. And, and the 800-pound gorilla uh, actually is technophobia. You know, we've had, those of us who are advancing science and technology, which, by the way, as I understand it, my fundamental understanding about what this conference is really about, and frankly, the work of Dr. Borlaug itself, essentially, is to democratize technology for the betterment of, uh, and improve technology for the betterment of mankind, especially as it pertains to food production and, and food security. So how is this done? Social policy? Right? Um, largely, no. The, the history of mankind is essentially the history of its technology. All of this stuff around us, and well, I don't have my phone with me, but you know, this, all of these, the system that you're hearing me speak on, is, these are the products of technology, these are not products of government decisions, social policy making, and so forth. Um, so if the food producers of the world are going to, uh, I think, uh, I think Per knows the numbers better than I do, but it's something like maybe a 69% improvement in the next 34 years on 
probably fewer arable acres and with no more water, probably less water. So that's the challenge. <clears throat> that can only be accomplished through technology. So maybe, maybe it's time for a talk about technophobia, which is what I want to talk with you about. That's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. I don't hear anybody actually speaking about technophobia and it's worth thinking about because it's our chief impediment. Because I am in the biotechnology field, um, I, can, I can confess to you that sometimes you can become frustrated, uh, you can become uh, even, you could really become a curmudgeon if you'd let yourself become a curmudgeon. Uh, because the debate, supposed debate, the faux debate, if you will, around the adoption of technology uh, frequently takes odd paths. One will receive questions like, uh, GMO, G, uh, how do you feel about the ethics of that? See. Ethics. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, you know, I, I did study ethics. I'm willing to have an ethical conversation about it anyway. You want to talk about whether we should be doing genetic modification of human gametes? I think you could have an ethical conversation about that. Uh, should we permit people to release gene drives into the environment? We could definitely have an ethical conversation about that. I'm violently opposed today. But the idea of simply masking fear by calling it ethics is absurd. Now, that said, and this is why you could become a curmudgeon, I don't think you should. And so what I want to talk about today is from a very practical perspective, what is technophobia? And then what could we do those of us who need to solve this problem and other problems that require adoption of new technologies, what can we do to deal in a very practical way with the problem of technophobia? So the first thing you need to understand is that it's not stupid. It actually is a broadly conserved, actually universally conserved in our species, set of attributes. Historically, let me just tell you, every one of you are technophobic, and so am I. Historically, mankind has always been technophobic. I can prove that mankind has been technophobic all the way back into prehistory. And you could say, how could you be so audacious and arrogant as to, as to uh, suggest that you can propose, uh, that you can prove something into prehistory, which by definition has no documentation by which, <laughs> by which you could offer that proof? It's quite easily. Let's look at the major pantheons of gods the Roman, Greek, Norse, all of the Norse ones, your, your, <laughs> your pantheon pair, right? Loki, Loki, right? What kind of character is Loki? Or Apollo, right? How is he regarded by his peers in these pantheons? By virtue of the fact that he brought mankind fire. He's regarded as a troublemaker, He's especially Loki. He's regarded as a troublemaker and a mischief maker by virtue of the fact that he brought us fire. What this fact tells us is that uh, there were early advocates uh, for the precautionary principle, right? That when fire in some primal horde was first being experimented with, uh, Ugwug proposed that you know, we ought to just leave that alone and never use that again because I touched it and ouch. And in fact, as we all know, fire actually is dangerous. So let's talk about technophobia. But the first admission is we're all technophobic. I'm afraid of social media. And you know what? My fear, I'm, I don't have a Facebook page or anything like that. I know people who use all these things to great advantage. And so I know that you know, I'm not going to you know, perish if I had, was involved with social media, but it just scares me. It seems like an invasion of my privacy. And for some, but you know, I have to admit to, I admit, um, I've never used it. So my fear is like a lot of fear based on my ignorance of the thing. All right. And I think we're all, we're all this way to a great extent. So the definition that's offered here is a fear of new technologies. Well, they don't have to be new technologies. I count at least three sources of technophobia. And the first one, it really relates to my, you know, I'm going to use a, an example from my childhood to illustrate. So this horrifying picture here, and it's not really horrifying, but you'll see why I say that in a minute, represents to me, you know, my parents were 
early adopters in the generation of convenience food consumers. And the first time I looked at something like this was, was at a roadside restaurant in uh, Colorado or something, and they were offering whole trout, and it had the eye, the head and the eye. Up until that time, I thought that fish came in rectangles of <laughs> breaded, which is the only fish I'd ever seen, and suddenly I'm staring at something like this. Now, admittedly, this is a more primitive, you know, technological presentation of this particular experience, right? But, um, so the point here is we fear the unfamiliar. And, you know, I mean, I looked at it, I asked my dad, do I have to eat the eye? <laughs> it was fearsome. Um, the second, so everybody fears the unfamiliar. And let me just mention, in, you know, this is infantile, right? Fearing the unfamiliar isn't something that we should ridicule. Uh, it's very, very broadly conserved uh, for a very good reason. The thing could eat you, right? That unfamiliar thing. <laughs> it's easy to understand why we fear the unfamiliar. Now, this one is something that uh, everybody involved in social policy and everybody relating to those who are involved in social policy really have, I, should, I think, should think about a lot, okay? There's a really legitimate reason why people fear technology from a social perspective. It's because it's unsettling. It's because it changes the landscape. It changes you know, who, is, who is winning and who's losing. If, if you had inherited uh, a blacksmith shop somewhere in America or Europe around the turn of the 20th century, and your family had been blacksmiths for 100 years, and you'd been enjoying a good living, and you had five or six children, and suddenly the automobile arrives, you can understand why you'd be upset. And by the way, that example that I just cited, let me give you some support for that example, because this actually occurred. Um, early in the days of the automobile, you know, automobile industry, then governor of New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson, later president of the United States, opined that his, his sympathies were with the people on the horses who were actually shooting firearms at the people who were driving those outrageous automobiles. Okay? So my point is, <clears throat> Look, if, you're, you know, if your family's been making yogurt and through some artisanal means, and here comes a new technology that is threatening to those art that, that artisanal construct, it, it, there's a it, what it could feel like emotionally and, and, and economically, certainly, is that somebody's changing the rules in the middle of the game, right? And this could feel very unfair. So technology definitely changes things, and it, and it changes the, our allocation of resources, and it's upsetting to people. The third, the third um, source of <laughs> third source of technophobia that I've been able to identify uh, is what I'll call neurotic guilt. So I picture, you know, I ask for a picture of a, a lottery winner because, as you may have read, you know, so many of these people have to seek psychiatric care. Right? I mean, it's it's closely related to survivor guilt. And so, why do I cite it in this conversation? It's because as our society has become increasingly um, technologically based, it means that we as, a, as citizens in this society are increasingly using uh, things and enjoying the benefits of things that we actually don't understand in terms of operational principle. I know everyone here has a cell phone. I, I doubt very many people, even in this extremely highly educated group, can tell me how a cell phone works physically. What's it based on? And there are so many elements in our society like that today, and this is true, largely true for the vast majority of people, that it could give rise to a reaction of conscience, which is what happens with lottery winners, and survivors, by the way, this is right in the case of survivor guilt. So I think that people, this may be what's partly what's behind the farm to table movement, uh, the idea that you only ought to buy food from people you know who grew it locally and that's the only thing that I'm going to put on my table. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not knocking that, I'm not criticizing that in any way, but I'm just saying we should recognize what the source of some of these uh, emotions are. Uh, and I think that our society is definitely setting a record. Uh, we've never, you know, there's certainly there's never been another generation of man that's de dependent on so much technology that we don't understand. And so we must recognize that it makes us, at, in, at some level, feel guilty because we know that we're receiving a benefit that we, at some level, at some basic level, feel that we don't deserve. Now, I, rationally, 
I think we do deserve it. We did inherit the work uh, of our forebears, uh, and we're entitled to inherit it, and we should not feel guilty about that. But a lot of classical literature and a lot of uh, psychiatric literature that proves that we actually do feel guilty about it. So, that being the case, again, <laughs> the case being technophobia is very, very broadly conserved. We all experience it. There are at least three sources of it. I'm sure there are more. These are the three that I've been able to think of. So what can we do practically? This picture illustrates just a couple of examples of technologies that, in fact, got adopted. Now, they got adopted notwithstanding the fact that people had plenty of phobia around these technologies, and to some extent still do. But yet the cell phone, the cell phone is the single most rapidly adopted technology in the history of the world. Think about it. The leading cell phone maker, Apple, uh, has a market capitalization of nearly $600 billion. So roughly the gross world product at the time of Queen Victoria. It's astonishing, right? ATMs, uh, early in my business career, I sat on a little think tank that was organized by Visa. When they were worrying about rolling out ATMs, the fear was that people would not want uh, their personal banking details to be accessible in a client-server architecture that was accessible from everywhere in the world. When you combine these two technologies, it's really scary. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but absolutely anybody in the world can figure out where you are based on the fact that you're carrying a cell phone. And any hacker with any skill at all can read all of your emails on any account you have on your cell phone. I'm merely pointing out that good technology usually does get adopted if it actually conveys perceived, comprehensible, tangible value to the consumer. In other words, if people like it, like they like cell phones and ATMs, they're willing to tolerate. They're willing to tolerate its shortcomings and its problems because they really want that benefit. And I think people largely do make this evaluation. And to a great extent, policymakers could realize more often that the market could really be making these decisions. The policymakers feel in this incredibly squeamish culture in which we live that they're being asked to sanction technology on the basis that it's always completely risk-free. Uh, that can almost never, tr never actually occur. Uh, and it's too, much, it's too much to ask of our governments. Uh, but in reality, as, as, as you see, technology does get adopted. And now I want to go to an example that's very near to my heart. So this one illustrates tangible value to the consumer. So this is an Arctic apple. Uh, what's different about this apple is that the apple on the left, that's the apple that you know. The apple on the right is this one. So it turns out that out in the edge of the genome of every stone fruit, there's a little enzyme system called polyphenol oxidase. It doesn't actually have anything to do with the metabolism of the plant. What it does is in response to shear force, so cutting, percussion, uh, you know, biting, is break down the cell wall, right? It releases an enzyme that breaks down the cell wall. Why might that have been so broadly conserved? Well, obviously, nature's interest in this apple and mine, right, are not the same. I want it to be that thing, the thing on the right, right? Nature wants it to be the thing on the left because it wants to find the most rapid course for the germination of those seeds. So by inhibiting the activity of this one enzyme system, you create something that we think is going to dramatically change the fortunes of the apple industry. U.S. apple industry has been in decline for 18 years. We think we have fixed the main problem with the apple, which is what you see there. People don't really want whole apples, actually. What they want are pre-sliced apples, and if you can't really offer pre-sliced apples today. I mean, there's a U.S. market of $500 million for pre-sliced pre -sliced apples. I don't know if you've ever tried any, uh, but it's a pretty hideous experience, in my opinion. <laughs> we have some of these you can sample. I believe this really does illustrate tangible consumer benefit. So on our market research and our interaction with media, 
uh, with consumer groups, with retailers, uh, uh, and testing uh, consumers. I think this may actually be and may become the most preferred GMO uh, food, uh, at least to date. Um, it, it, it's, it's almost impossible to find someone who has tried it who doesn't love it. <laughs> so uh, now, now our job is just to grow a lot of these and we're working on it. The next example shows a production advantage. So one of the things my company has done is brought forward and obtained FDA Health Canada approval for the world's first genetically modified food animal. It's called the Aqua Advantage Salmon. It comes to market weight in one half the time and on about 25% uh, less food. This is a $15 billion category of extremely nutritious food. Uh, today, 95% uh, of the salmon consumed in the United States is imported, mostly from Norway and Chile. They're grown in sea cages. They are, in, in my opinion, environmentally questionable, <laughs> uh, of environmentally questionable merit. <laughs> Uh, and a lot of environmental groups, I will say, you can look this, you know, feel the same way. Think about it. How do you grow salmon in a, in a sea cage that's in the ocean, right? You have to pour food on it, which means you attract all the indigenous marine life, which, which brings every pathogen they, that they could possibly bring to your caged salmon, which is why the loss from caged salmon in sea cages is as high as 50%. They all get sea lice. It's a big problem. We don't know how to solve it they could get microbial infections, so we then have to pour antibiotics on these. So here I want to talk about the other way that we can help technology become adopted, uh, and that's by managing the asset correctly. So here we have this thing, it's bound to engender some fear in some quarters um, because it is genetically modified. So how are we going to bring this asset forward now that we have regulatory approval and we've proven that it's safe and nutritious and indistinguishable from a wild-type salmon nutritionally? We're going to grow them on land. First of all, uh, all of our salmon are sterile females. We don't want any possibility that they can um, breed with local populations. Second is, we're only gr going to grow them on land. That way they won't have any antibiotics, they won't have sea lice, we'll be able to monitor them very closely, we'll be able to grow them here in Des Moines and offer the restaurants of Iowa fresh, beautiful, pathogen-free, sea lice-free, antibiotic-free salmon at a value that will beat what you could get from importing them from sea cages in Norway. So, my favorite slide. And not because it has numbers on it or shows money. That's not my favorite part about it. My favorite part about it is here's the proof of the point I made earlier. Technology does get adopted. Right? Look at this. I mentioned before, uh, you know, back there, it looks like, like zero on this scale, but, you know, 1875 or so, the gross world product, as I mentioned, was approximately equal to one Apple corporation today, right? Um, what is going on in the world today is absolutely phenomenal, and it's the reason that we do not suffer uh, a great deal more famine than we have today. Everybody remembers Reverend Thomas Malthus. I know for, to this crowd you guys know all this stuff better than I do. But the thing to bear in mind is, based on the assumptions that he had, the Reverend Thomas Malthus was 100% correct. Just like the current World Wildlife Fund slide that I could show you there, is it looks just like Malthus's. It says that uh, at our present rate of removing all, these <laughs> removing all these resources and extracting all these resources, we're doomed. We're absolutely doomed. We have to figure out which, which three billion people you know, alive today must die, effectively, if you read this slide correctly. They don't actually put it that way, but if you read the slide correctly and by its implications, it means there's no way the population of this earth can grow, and in fact, we should shrink it, all right? People who've been making that prediction now, ever since the time of Malthus, in every generation, they have always been correct, based on the assumptions that they had. However, historically, they've been wrong 100% of the time. Why? because their assumptions were wrong. Why were their assumptions wrong? It's because we do adopt technology. Technology does improve our life. The history of man is his technology. So I feel very confident about the future if we're allowed to use technology to solve these problems. I'm completely confident that we can overcome uh, the challenges that we have in food, in energy, uh, in health, uh, in environment, um, if we're permitted to do so. 
I think we need to be intelligent in the management of these assets that we develop. Um, I think we need to insist on science-based regulation uh, that is conscientious and, and, and thorough. Um, uh, but with those expectations, I'm very confident of the future. Again, um, I, I, think that the, I think that this particular organization is exemplary uh, in this way. Um, and it's an honor to be here. Thank you very much.